David Marsh. I'm the chairman of OMFIF, and it's a great pleasure to be talking to Barnabas Virag, uh, who is one of the deputy governors of the Magia Nevzeti Bank, responsible for monetary policy and also responsible for the most important part of, uh, you might say, his job, which is external relations. And of course, we're talking now about the issue of Hungary as a borrower on world capital markets. And I'd like to ask you, Barnabas, to begin with, looking at the whole macro picture of Hungary, we've had a lot of upheaval, a lot of turmoil in Europe over the last three or four years. Where would you say we are now, just if you look at the main parameters of growth, inflation and the current account? Okay, thank you, David, for the invitation uh, to this podcast. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, you are absolutely right that um, this decade... Uh, brought new challenges for for Europe and for especially for Central Eastern Europe. So nowadays, we are, in the last three years, we faced with a triple crisis. Started with the COVID crisis in 2020, followed by the energy crisis since the mid of 2021, and after that, uh, a very terrible uh, war started in 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 Ukraine in 2022. So of course, all of these challenges have a big had a big impact on the uh, in the growth trajectories, in the inflation environment, in the current account developments, not only in Hungary but in the whole region. Um, in case of Hungary, we can say that uh, one of the key aspects of the story was the energy shock uh, we saw in the last uh, last year in 2022. Uh, which had a big impact on the inflation numbers on the one hand and on the other uh, on the other hand the current account position of the country which is a very important indicator in case of a small and open economy like Hungary uh, nowadays uh, and I, I think the key from a macro policy perspective is to to maintain uh, the stability in your economy both in real economic terms and also in in financial st uh, stability terms. So if I look at the numbers, I, I have to say that we are in a good track. Uh, so if I look at the real economic numbers, the labor market situation remained very stable. Um, the unemployment ratios are still uh, below 4%. So we are near to the full employment situation in the economy. Uh, the recovery from the COVID-19 crisis uh, was, uh, was very fast. Of course, the, the war in Ukraine had a negative impact on, on our numbers in 2022. So, so nowadays we, we had a technical recession in the last couple of quarters, but looking ahead, uh, based on our high frequency indicators, the recovery will start as soon as the inflation will get into the, into the single digit territory. So we have a good chance that uh, the the recovery can be can be very fast and and Hungary will be able to continue the catching up process in the coming years. So how, how current... confident how confident are you, Barnabas, that you will get into single digit territory for inflation? Because that has been the black mark, hasn't yeah. it, uh, for yeah. Hungary? You've had a an inflation rate well above the European average now during this crisis, but you're fairly confident that the worst is by far over, and you're going to be somehow rejoining the mainstream. Yeah, you, you are you're absolutely absolutely right, David. So so that's the number one enemy. So that's the key enemy nowadays for economy to bring down the inflation again to the single digit territory. Uh, we started the year with the more than 25% inflation in January. Uh, and now looking at our expectations and looking at the expectations of the market participants, it, it, it's very certain that uh, we will close the year uh, with a single digit inflation far below 10% in, in my estimation, somewhere between seven to 8% inflation. So I think it's a, it's a big achievement. So looking at the historical experiences, if in a country the inflation step into the about 20% range, uh, looking, at the experience, looking at the history, it takes at least two years. Uh, bringing down the inflation again to the single digit territory. So now it's very clear, looking at the details that Hungary uh, is able to control the inflation within a year. So we will well, be able to, to push, down, push down the inflation uh, to the single digit territory 
till the end of this year. And after that, we have to continue the disinflation. And I think we also have a good chance to, do, to deliver that. Well, I want to get into this issue about inflation expectations and the role that your monetary policy has played in all this. But just sticking on the macro side, in terms of energy, that clearly you are very vulnerable to the energy shock. Have you managed to diversify significantly your sources of energy? Because, of course, you are still partly dependent on uh, energy coming in from Russia. Yeah, of course. So in case of Hungary, it's a very sensitive point. So, so we are net importer on the energy side. So in line with that, as I mentioned, the current account position of the country deteriorated um, very sharply in 2022. Uh, so we had more than 8% current account deficit in the last year. So looking at the number numbers in this year, I think, uh, I think we are in a clear uh, and very rapid, uh, rapidly improving pass uh, in the last couple of quarters. So for example, in the second quarter, the current account position of the country jumped slightly into the positive territory. So I think now we have a very good chance that uh, the current account position of the country can be somewhere around, around the zero level. So, so it's a very, very sharp improvement in the uh, financing position of the country, which is also very important in this very volatile uh, environment we have nowadays uh, globally. Of course, uh, to change the whole structure of the, of the energy sector, uh, will uh, take some time, but but uh, but we have our own strategy. So the development started. So now we try to diversify uh, our our import strategy in in all of the directions. I can say, on the one hand, and of course on the other hand, we try to uh, speed up the transition to the green energies, to to use the solar energy uh, and to use other other green sources in, within our energy mix. Foreign investors are clearly worried about any country's vulnerability to energy shocks. So would you say that Hungary has also benefited from some degree of solidarity from the rest of the EU because there have been changes in pipeline arrangements and so on? Uh, and all the countries, including Germany, say that was 55% dependent, they've all had to make these big, big changes. So would you say Hungary has... Be, really been part of the mainstream in in terms of trying to make itself less vulnerable to pressure coming from abroad regarding energy supplies yeah 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 absolutely i think that's the case so but but we have to know that uh, within this whole energy issue the key is to deliver our own homework so so i think uh, that's the key for all of the countries um I see one of that's one of the key points in the in the coming years and in, in the coming decade. If I look at uh, the aspects of of the impact on inflation, the impact on, on competitiveness, on the impact on, on the growth trajectory. So we cannot wait for for other countries. We have to find our own solutions. Uh, and but I think the, I, and I think the government uh, uh, made a, a very successful uh, decision on that field in the last couple of years. Uh, diversifying the the energy import uh, from from different relations. Well, I think people will be very um, pleased and reassured about that. What about on the trade side? You've mentioned that the current account is improving. Um, it's a difficult market to try to uh, diversify your exports because China, for example, is going through a pretty bad state. But you you are trying to diversify also your export side in order to also make yourself less vulnerable. How well has that gone? Would you say? Yeah, you're right. So, so Hungary is a very open economy with a high uh, share of export to to GDP. So for us, uh, a successful export performance is a key. Uh, and of course, within the current volatile environment, uh, the uncertain world economic outlook, it's 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 a tough game to deliver. Um, so if I look at the outlook of the of the European economy, look at if I look at the outlook of the of the Chinese economy, you are right that on the demand side there are some risk um, on the downside. But the good news in our case is that uh, in the last couple of years a lot of new FDI came into the country, especially in, into the manufacturing industry. Um, so I think uh, uh, I think the government. Uh, was was very successful in inviting the FDI into the country in the last couple of years. 
and 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 I think it will be it will be a very important point as soon as this new FBI we turn into the production phases. Uh, it will add an extra boost to the to the export side, and it it will improve the market share. It will help us to improve the market share in the global uh, economy. And I think uh, in the in the coming years it will help us to offset the negative the impact of the negative demand environment globally. Uh, so I think um, not only the export impact uh, is very relevant in this story. We have to take into account that we are living in the world of of the very tough competition. So I think nowadays uh, we are living in a uh, in a world where we have to compete. Uh, for the skilled labor, uh, for the new investments, for the new technologies. Uh, and, and now the competition is getting tougher and tougher, especially if I take into account the geopolitical tensions we have. So in case of an open economy, it's a key point uh, to remain very attractive for the, for the investors. And I think, uh, I think Hungary... Uh, made a very very good job on that field. So if I look as, at as the you tax say, system, as, as you say, you have to rely on your own efforts, don't you? You're not a member of monetary union. Uh, you're not protected by some kind of shield from monetary union. In terms of external debt, um, the fact that you're attracting FDI means that uh, it's a good sign because it means you're not actually having to sell bonds uh, to so much in order to cover the. Uh, current account deficit that you might be you're getting equity as well which is very very helpful very stabilizing what is your external debt situation and how do you expect that to develop in coming years uh, so the trend is very clear so we started uh, after the last financial crisis uh, with a excellent net external debt posure, exposure around 50 percent in share of gdp uh, until the end of uh, the last decade, we were able to bring down this number to around 8%. Mm. Uh, so, so there was a huge improvement. So nowadays, of course, there was a little bit increase in that uh, uh, net external net exposure, somewhere above 10%. But looking ahead, the picture is very clear that we were able to uh, uh, push down this number towards the zero level. As soon as the current account position, the current account exposure of the country will improve further, as I mentioned, through the uh, extra uh, boost in case of the export sector with a higher market share. So, so all in all, I think we will have a good chance to, how to say, to, to step from above zero line to below zero line uh, somewhere in this decade. Yes. Let's just get on to some of the more classic ingredients of central bank policy. Um, your bank has always had the reputation of being very innovative in terms of monetary yeah. policy. I remember after the 2008-2009 crisis, um, you did all kinds of things, some of which actually did act as a spur and as, a, as an incentive for other central banks. What would you say has been the balance sheet of these policies uh, over the last uh, uh, 15 or 16 years? Because, of course, lately you've just had to be doing good old-fashioned interest rate increases, haven't you? That's been the key question in the last couple of years. Have you managed to maintain this spirit of innovativeness in the last three or four years? So, so look at, yeah, uh, I, I, I think it's very important to read well the data and read well the general environment we are in, in we are moving. Uh, on. Uh, so, of course, now, the key enemy, the number one enemy, is the inflation everywhere in the world, especially in our region here in here in uh, here in the Central Eastern European region. So that's why now uh, I think uh, through the interest rate policy, it's better to remain uh, on the conservative side because, on the short run, the key issue is the very high inflation. So now we have to bring down the inflation first, and after that, we have to look at. Uh, the other options, how to uh, support uh, the sustainability in the economy, how to support the sustainable and stable environment in our economy. So all in all, I think now the key uh, is to, to bring down the inflation uh, to a low territory again, because through that we can support uh, the real income growth in the economy again, we can support 
uh, a more predictable environment which is needed for the for the new investments and so on and so on but after that i think uh, i think we need again innovative solutions right uh, so how so long do you think this will last do you think that your easing when it eventually comes will take place after the european central bank starts to ease because we don't know exactly when that will be either but w would you say there'll be a lag between yourself and the ecb because you will have to maintain a certain conservative policy so looking at the the external side of the economy we have a very close relationship with the with the eurozone so of course those price developments we will see in case of the in case of the eurozone or in case of china will have an impact on the Hungarian numbers so i i think it's pretty clear our strategy uh, I think our strategy was that uh, we were the first, one of the first central bank in Europe who who said in mid of 20, 20, 2021 that uh, okay here is the risk of inflation, which is uh, not only a transitory phenomenon; it seems more permanent one. So that's why we decided to to open our rate hiking cycle in in mid of twenty twenty one. Since then, we made. A, uh, a very very significant uh, tightening in our in our monetary policy conditions, and now we can see a very clear signal uh, for the for the successes. So as I mentioned, that the very widespread disinflation started uh, in the first uh, quarter of this year, and and I think we have a good chance uh, to bring down the inflation to the low territory somewhere in the next year. And I think we will be able to achieve our inflation target somewhere in uh, in twenty twenty five. Uh, yeah, but, 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 but you're saying you'll only really take the reward in terms of lower interest rates when you're absolutely sure that inflation is under control. Uh, yes, yeah, so of of course. So so now, as I mentioned, the key is to control the inflation, to key the inflation expectations. So I think we know well from the from the from the history that. High inflation is a painful phenomenon for the for the whole economy, for the society. But if the inflation remains high for a permanent period, it's it's a disaster. It's a catastrophe for, yes. for the economy. So that's why we, now we have to deliver our best together with the fiscal policy, together with the competition authority to bring down uh, the inflation to a low level again. And after that, I think we have to start on thinking on the so-called green central banking. So yes. I think that's the, and that will be the number one mid-term or, or longer-term issue for the for the central banks how well, to, well, a lot how to of support people, the green transition. A lot of people are very interested in that. I want to ask you about that right at the very end. But you've mentioned a couple of times that inflation is public enemy number one. Uh, do the people actually buy into that? You've said that. For instance, you do surveys. You have your own view about how credible is the Central Bank of Hungary. A lot of central banks have lost credibility over the last couple of years because they didn't take inflation seriously. What is your view about public support for this policy of tight monetary policy? And the all important question of your credibility in the public, which I know you do do surveys and so on. What is your view of that, uh, Barnabas? So look at when, when the inflation is, is jumping to a very high level, it's it's not a, how to say, very popular position to be to be a central banker. I think that's the case nowadays uh, in many countries. Uh, but of course, we have to know that in midterm, without the price stability, is 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 pretty hard to continue the strong growth performance and to continue the whole catching up story. So that was that was our case uh, uh, in the last last one one and a half years. So of course, when when the inflation went up to 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 ten percent. Uh, there was some uh, conversation. There was some debate. Okay, it's only driven by supply side factors or 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 other uh, elements or not. Uh, so what can be the proper reaction on the central bank side? So that so that was the debate on on that point. But 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 I think it's very clear if the if the inflation is is jumping to a very high level to about twenty percent, it doesn't matter. Uh, it is driven by supply side or demand side uh, is issues because the fact is that the inflation is very high and very painful for the whole society. So now I think uh, uh, I think the the credibility of our staff, the credibility of the of the central bank uh, decisions improved a lot in the last 
last couple of quarters as the domestic agents, as the households, as the firms uh, started to realize, okay, here are the results. Uh, the inflation will drop to, to the single digit territory within a year. And in the next year, we will be able to operate in a more normal world. Yeah, well, the proof of the pudding, as they say, will be in the eating, but you do yeah. seem to be on a good path. Uh, what to ask you about the reserve management activities? As you know, we at OMFI, we look into this a great deal. And of course, a lot of people have noticed the fact that you have been diversifying your relatively small uh, holdings of gold uh, have uh, increased tremendously uh, since about 2018. Could you sum up the reasons why that's been the case and how does that help you in terms of the credibility and the reinforcement of the backing of yeah, yeah, yeah. central bank yeah uh, i have to say that it's, it's it's very very interesting to see nowadays the comments i saw on the field of global um, gold markets uh, and seeing that uh, many emerging markets uh, many emerging central banks uh, made a very similar decision increasing their own uh, gold holdings. So yeah, you are right. So we decided about that in 2018 first. So we, uh, at that point, we had a very limited amount of, of, of gold in our, in our reserves. So since then, uh, we increased the amount of gold reserve from three tons of gold to uh, more than uh, 94 uh, tons of gold. So, so yeah, we, we made a very significant purchases in the last couple of years. On that field, uh, of course, the main motivation behind the behind the decision is 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 on the one hand the diversification within the uh, within the reserve management, and on the other hand, I think I think within this environment we have nowadays globally. So now we have geopolitical tensions on the one hand, uh, we have high inflation uh, on the other hand. Uh, the third element is. We are, we are talking about the future of money, uh, what can be the proper form of the, of the, fu uh, of the future money. So, so I think nowadays there are tectonical shifts in the, in, in, in the world economy. And, and in this situation, that's again the history, uh, the gold can play uh, more strategic roles in in your life, so so I think that's the other aspect of our decision. I do, I, so I it's, it's talking, not a short term remember, issue. It, I think it's more you know, long term. Long -term well, I think it strategy. is because I remember I remember talking to you and your colleagues about this maybe ten years ago, and you were talking about a strategy like this. Are you going to continue uh, topping up your gold reserves as we go in to coming years? Of course, it will depend on the decision of, of the Monetary Policy Committee. So, so, so it's clear that nowadays the trend is that the emerging uh, central bankers are more interested in uh, go, uh, gold uh, holding. Uh, so I think it's worth to look at uh, quite closely the market trends we have nowadays and, and uh, if it is needed to decide any uh, potential further purchases. But of course, you are now getting a decent return now on, say, dollar uh, or even euro reserves. Uh, that makes a difference. I wanted to ask you about the issue about central bank losses. I know that's been something that has been concerning you from a technical and a legal point of view. Uh, do you think the gold holdings could be helpful in terms of staunching some of these losses through some kind of revaluation accounts at some stage? Or is it a bit too early to say? I think you've resolved some of the issues regarding your losses, the losses being caused, of course, by the fact that your the cost of your liabilities is very high because the deposit rate has got to be so high, and yet the the returns on your assets have been relatively low. Yeah, yeah, I think nowadays it's a, it's a very common challenge for for all of the central bankers in the world. So on the one hand, we are facing with a permanently high inflation environment, uh, and we would like to cope against uh, this very high inflation through uh, high uh, interest rates. And I think these high interest rates will remain permanently, uh, maybe permanently uh, uh, with us. And on the other hand, we, had, we have a huge central bank balance sheets, uh, which increased a lot in the last more than one decade. Of course, of course the result is that your uh, uh, capital position start to deteriorate, so that's the that's the trend nowadays. 
and and I think at some point the central bankers have to choose uh, between uh, two solutions. The first solution, okay, you say, okay, I'm not able to fight against the high inflation so effectively because uh, my capital position start to uh, start to deteriorate very fastly. On that case, the central bankers will not able to control the 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 inflation the, and to bring down the inflation to a low level. The other uh, option is to saying that okay, I would like to cope against uh, the high inflation in an effective way, but in that case, my capital position maybe will turn to the negative side. I think I think the second option is is the better better one. So so I think one of the key capital elements for the central bank is the credibility. So we have to remain credible. Uh, we have to uh, successfully. Uh, achieve our own mandates, providing the price stability, providing the financial stability. So that's the role of the central bank. And, and I think in that, uh, in that uh, uh, fight, we need more flexible approach on the capital side. Well, of the, you're, you're of the, absolutely the right there. Bank. And of course, you are not alone there. It's become uh, a subject of some debate, uh, the losses of the Bundesbank. And Joachim Nagel, the head of the Bundesbank, he says exactly as you do, Priority has to be the fight against inflation. The balance sheet considerations, although important, have to be in second place. So I think that's important for Hungary, but you're not alone in that issue. Could I just ask you, in uh, coming to the end of this uh, video, th about the international borrowing? Now, you've mentioned the importance about the anti-inflation fight. I think that is the supreme priority, not just for the Hungarian people, but also for investors. What other things do you concentrate upon, Barnabas, when you're talking to foreign investors? As you said, it's a tough world out. There's a lot of competition. So how do you distinguish yourself uh, from other borrowers when it comes to trying to attract uh, investment on the fixed income markets into your country? So look, at I, I think uh, I think one of the key message to the to the investor is that uh, that the Hungarian market and the Hungarian economy uh is a stable economy so so i think it's very clear that uh in the last one one and a half year the hungarian policy makers uh, were successfully uh, uh solve uh, were able to successfully solve the uh their own homeworks so so now we are in a in a in a good track in case of the current account position we are in a good track in case of inflation I think the recovery in the real economy will start uh, in the third quarter of this year, and and we can expect a much stronger near four percent growth for the for the next year. Uh, we are still a, a, an active, very attractive destination for the for the FDI, as I mentioned. So all in all, I think the stability is the key for an investor. You can be real economic investor, real investor, or or, or financial investor. So I see. I can say that okay. Uh, the mentioned cheaper crisis we had in this decade uh, hit the Hungarian economy in some very sensitive points. Uh, but uh, but I can say our economy is flexible enough, uh, and and our policymakers, uh, both on the monetary and the fiscal side, are strongly committed uh, to maintain the stability. And 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 now I think the the first results are are visible, and the whole story will uh, will be visible for all of the investors who, who follow the Hungarian story. Well, certainly setting a, a system of of, uh, of flexibility, but persistence at the same time. I just want to mention, since we're coming to the end now, this issue about the green bond market and so on. You you have developed a number of innovative instruments there. Uh, it's, this is not only because of the need to diversify your sources of energy and so on. It's also because I think it's a very great source of attractiveness for the international bond markets that you're showing this innovative capacity. What, what uh, areas can we expect Hungary to be some kind of pioneer when it comes to uh, green bond issues and in general, the greening of your monetary policy? What do you think we should be looking out for in uh, 2024? So we can say in in one field uh, we were a pioneer. So Hungary uh, was one of the, the Hungarian Central Bank was one of the first central bank within Europe to get uh, uh, a green mandate in in 2021. 
Uh, so, so now we have a green mandate uh, in our sense of bank law. Uh, but as I mentioned, now the key enemy, the, the, the public enemy is the inflation. So now we are focusing on, 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 the, on the fight against the inflation. Uh, but as soon as we can say, okay, uh, the inflation is under control, we reached again the low and stable inflation environment. At that point, we have to raise the question again, how to support uh, the green transition. Because a successful green transition uh, in the in the midterm, I can't imagine uh, stable inflation environment, stable uh, financial sector. So, so that's why I think it's a, it's a key point where the central banks uh, have to be more active in the coming in the coming future. So now we have, um, as I mentioned, now we have a green green mandate. In the last years, we had some some green program uh, supporting the the lending market, the credit market in case of in, in case of the firms and in case of the in case of the households. Uh, now there is also also a green uh capital requirement re re reduction program uh for the for the hungarian banks to support uh the build up of of, of green credits uh so i think uh, we will continue both the on the regulate regulatory side and also in the in the monetary policy side uh, to support the green transition now i think it's too early to to say any details uh, because as I mentioned, now the, the public enemy is the inflation. So now we have to cope against the first inflation. Thing, first. But we have, well, we have to be ready uh, to deliver our best uh, to support the green transition. And we will do that. Uh, well, we'll certainly look out for that in 2024. Just want to ask you one last question. Uh, you are a member of the uh, European system of central banks within the ECB. You're a shareholder of the ECB. Uh, you're a member of the EU, even though you're not in monetary union. What is the outlook, would you say, for Hungary at one stage in the future joining monetary union? Do you think you're on a glide path towards that from an economic po point of view? You've got to get over the politics as well, though. What would be your view about this? Is this certainly a five or six year perspective, I would say, not a question for 2024. But give us your longer term horizon, please, on that question. Yeah. Uh some years ago, we, we, we brought uh, a book about, the, about this question. So it's pretty clear that uh, we have to rethink uh, those criteria so we assess the potential timing of, of, of any, any introduction to the Eurozone. So it's pretty clear that it's not enough to, uh, to deliver the so-called nominal criteria. In case of a country, we have to focus more on the, on the real uh, criteria as the competitiveness, uh, the GDP per capita numbers, and so on and so on. So, so my my key message is that uh, we are interested in to to join to the to the euro area, but of course the key is the timing. So we have to find the proper timing, uh, and we have to join to the euro area at that point where we can say, okay, I'm ready, both on the on the nominal side of the economy and also in the real side in the economy. So now uh, I mentioned that that's the key for the policymakers to deliver their own homework. So now our own homework is to, uh, to improve the competitiveness further within the economy, to improve the productivity growth uh, in the economy, uh, to, to, to improve the fiscal balance. And after that, we can open the question what can be the proper timing of, 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 the, of the Euro introduction. So now I think that's the phases of the work. And after that, we can talk about the, the proper timing. Well, we're starting to talk really about processes that uh, can be many, many years. But I do think it's important that you also act as a kind of pace setter in some areas of monetary policy from outside monetary union. And the greater the success you have, in terms of stability, getting inflation down to more reasonable numbers, the more people will listen to you and they'll look at you and they'll say, well, look, this is helpful, what you're doing, some pioneering work on, say, uh, green monetary policy and, and so on. So good luck in all this. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Barnabas, for taking us through 
these measures that you're doing. It's clearly a very serious body of work that you're um, undertaking here, and you're about to get some fruits from this, I would say, in terms of getting inflation rate down to what is internationally an acceptable uh, level. So many thanks for giving us this talk, and we look forward to keeping in touch with you during the not just 2024, but beyond, to see how well you're doing, uh, to monitor your progress, and also to help foreign investors understand a little bit more about what they're investing in in Hungary. So thank you very much indeed for this video, and we look forward to keeping up all the links with you in the coming years. Okay, thank you very much, David, and see you next time, maybe personally. Well, I look forward to that. All the best. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, all the best. Bye-bye.